Welcome to Word Pictures, a program of discussion and discovery. We examine the stories, events, and persons as described in the Word Pictures, presented in the 66 books of Scripture we know as the Word of God. But what kind of God is pictured here? By reading these stories, some become fearful, others adore. Yet others are just confused. Come, let us see for ourselves in an unrehearsed, no question barred discussion with people just like you as we search for the God of these stories. What picture of God will emerge for you? Let's join the discussion right now. Welcome to Word Pictures. We're glad you joined us. I'm going to be reading Revelation 20, 1 to 3 from the New American Standard Bible. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven holding the keys of the abyss and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold of the dragon, the serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And he threw him into the abyss and shut it and sealed it over him so that he would not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were completed. Wow. Sounds like someone's getting rid of someone here. Yeah, it sure does, doesn't it? And we just talked about earlier in the book of Revelation, this is, we've had these two sides battling, 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 battling. What's going on here? Is God all of a sudden saying, it's time to do something? Sounds like it, doesn't it? Yes. In my version, it talks about he sees the dragon, he chained him up, he threw him into the abyss, he locked it, and he sealed it. Wow. Does that remind you of anything? The ancient dragon? Well, it's Satan. Okay, but Revelation where... Revelation 12, we had a quite... A, Revelation yeah, 12, and what other place in the Bible? Does it remind you of anything way back? The Garden of Eden. The Garden yeah. of Eden. The serpent deceiving Eve, right? That's and what I was going to say about this. Satan was shut up, shut, uh, sealed and everything so he would not deceive. It didn't say so that he would not kill the people on the earth, no. but that he would not deceive. We're going to talk about why that would be a little bit later, so hang on. That's his life blood, his deception. Yeah, mean, that's what, yeah. what energizes him. That's what keeps him. Yeah. Active. So, and what do we know about this bottomless pit, this abusos it is in Greek? Do we know anything about that? That was the name God used to describe the earth before it was, before he made a world out of it, right? Components. But not only that, in Isaiah 14, <laughs> two places, Isaiah 14, Look at verse 15, it, and remember Isaiah 14 is the time it talks about the history of Satan, but it says in verse 15, but instead you have been brought down to the deepest part of the world of the dead, and guess what the word is in, in the Greek translation? Abusos. Abusos, the world of the dead. And you could find that also in Isaiah 24, verse 22. So, and what else do we find here? What's he trying to do, as Jim suggested? He can't deceive the nations anymore. His dece deceptions are intentional. He's like Jim said, that's Satan's lifeblood. And you remember that's way back from the Garden of Eden. Um, Everything so, he does. I yeah. mean, in Revelation 12, it says he ca his tail swept down a third. He convinced a third of the heavenly intelligences. So when you come to the end of a book, and we're almost at the very end of the Bible now, and we're almost at the end of the book of Revelation, what do you expect to find at the end of a, of a book? Especially if it's, let's say, a mystery book. <laughs> what happens at the end? The answers to the questions. You come, you get the answers to the questions, right? So is this the answer to the question? God finally gets fed up with all this stuff's going on, and he grabs Satan, and he throws him in the bottomless pit and he locks him up. That's the answer, right? He could have done that years ago. He could have. He could have, but he didn't. So why is he doing it now? Finally, he's got, an, everybody's made a decision for or against mm -hmm. God. 
Well, we saw that there was a beginning of the story, and who was there in the beginning of the story of the Great Controversy? Satan with his group of angels. We're now at the end of the story, of the Bible anyway, and who's there? Satan with his angels. Now we've had his, his, his human associates have been thrown into the lake of fire at the end of chapter 19. So now to, who does he have left? Only Satan and his angels, right? That's what would be left, right? Mm -hmm. And what happens in the middle of the story? You know, usually you have a beginning and you get introduced to it, and then there's a middle part of the book, and that's the, that's the whole story, what's going on, and then at the end you get the answers. So what's the middle of part of God's story? The righteous go to heaven. Well, well that's part of the isn't, end. Isn't it Jesus' crucifixion? Yeah. The middle of the story would be the life and death of Jesus, wouldn't it, as far as the Bible is concerned? Yeah. I thought you meant in relation to this chapter. Yeah, no, you're, you're right as far as that part is concerned. So, Ellen White has led Adventists to take a, a cosmic conflict view uh, in understanding the book of Revelation. But when we're talking to our scholarly Christian friends, it's very difficult because there's such a strong bias toward the Roman imperial in power interpretation of the book of Revelation. They remember they don't believe that even God can predict the future. So everything that's predicted here in the book of Revelation has to be something that's either has happened in the past in the days of John or is happening at that time or going to happen in the immediate future that's already you can see it, you see it starting to happen in the book of John. There's no way down in the future kind of predictions. So to talk to them it's, is a real problem. And what do they do with this part? They don't know what to do with this part of the book of Revelation. It does not make sense to them. Yeah. And we'll look, at, we'll look at some of the verses that suggest that. So their God is more limited than yeah. our God. Very much so. Or how we define God is less limiting than how he may be defined by others. A famous scholar once said by the name of Steinmetz, sometimes everything is confusing until you come to the ending. So the wisest thing you can do all, some, sometimes is to cheat and read the ending first. <laughs> Reading well, the book essentially backwards. Didn't God say in the Bible, I wrote these things in the Bible about the future, so when they come to pass, you will know that I mm -hmm. was able to predict the future. You will know that, that mm -hmm. um, I was God. I was God, yeah. So last week we talked about the why question. And what was the why question? We just mentioned it briefly, and now we're going to talk about it. Remember what the why question is? If God's going to do it now, why didn't he do it sooner? Why does, why does God allow Satan to, in effect, wreak havoc on this earth for so many years without doing anything? Isn't that a, isn't that a fair why question? I have another why. Okay. okay why, once uh, Satan is tied up and what have you, mm -hmm. Jesus is going to uh, reign without interference from Satan for a thousand years. Mm -hmm. Isn't that somewhat biased regarding the people who lived then? How come I didn't get that chance? I would have liked to be there. To be when? <laughs> to just be just Jesus and me without... Well, you have a chance to be there. That's exactly what we're all supposed to be a part of. That's, that's the righteous being taken to heaven. If you're, if you're among the righteous, you'll be there. No, but he's saying earth. Well, where, which, which passage are you talking about? Where am I? Uh, it said Jesus going to come to it earth. It says he's going to, there's one place that says he's going to reign, but it doesn't say on earth. Uh, but he's going to come back eventually, and that, of course, will be the righteous in, in Revelation 21 and 22. Ah, uh, thank you. The there was that parable about God hired a person at the beginning of the day and was going to pay him, and hired a person a later, middle later. day, and hired a person an hour before quitting time, and that person got the same amount of pay as the yeah. person who started first. And I think that is that we should be glad to work for God, even if our duty is more heavy than other people. Like, I think the Adventist church is, has a very hefty duty on uh, what they're supposed to be telling the world. And uh, maybe some people who lived in the past will go to heaven and haven't had to do as hard a work. And God is saying, you know, all of you um, should be happy to work for me no matter what your pay is. Mm -hmm. 
Let, let's, let's, it's always useful to look at other places in the Bible that might be talking about the same thing. We're talking now about why is Satan bound and sort of thrown into a pit. Look at John 12. The Gospel of John, verse 12, and I mean the Gospel of John, chapter 12, verse 31. Now is Jesus, and this is the remember the time when the Greeks came and said, we want to see Jesus. Jesus says, now is the time for this world to be judged. Now, wouldn't that be somewhere near the end, right? Mm -hmm. Now the ruler of this world will be overthrown. Who's the ruler of this world? Who is he talking about? Satan. Satan. He's talking about Satan. Will be overthrown. It, wouldn't that be equal to the time he's thrown in the pit? Sounds like the same time, doesn't it? When I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw everyone to me. So who's acting in these, verse, these two verses? Jesus. We have to be careful. Who is the active agent in these two verses? What do you mean, Jesus. active agent? Jesus. The active. Oh, active we are. agent. Jesus. We are, aren't we? No, Jesus we is. Lift, Jesus. Let's read it lift, again. Don't we lift Jesus up? Well, listen. That's, it says when he is lifted up. Mm -hmm. So oh, nothing this. will happen until that's happened. Right? Okay, but hold on. Okay. Now is the time for this world to be judged. I'm going to read it again. The world is going to be judged. Now the rule of this world will be overthrown. Doesn't tell us who's doing it. These are both passive voices, right? The world will be is to be judged. That's passive. The ruler of this world will be overthrown. That's passive. When I am lifted up from the earth, that's another passive. But then I will draw everyone to me. Now, is that passive or active? Active. That's active. So the only active verse, passage of words, and that whole thing is, I will draw everyone to me. So does that... Do, is that a hint that maybe God, Jesus was active in those earlier passages? That's the question. Was he, had, did he have anything to do with the overthrow of Satan? Yes. Of course. Well, he said earlier, back in Luke 10, verse 18, Jesus answered them, here's his disciples who come back from traveling around Perea, and they said, Jesus, we're so excited, even the devils are subject to us. And what does Jesus say? I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Okay? Who was active there in that, in that case? Jesus. Jesus said, I saw. Mm -hmm. Oh, but it doesn't say who threw him. Doesn't say. Well, we could go on with questions. Like, why doesn't God just kill the devil? I mean, if you got him locked up, and it's near the end of the whole story, you know, you know all the wicked are dead. Just do it. Everybody else is all, all everybody else wicked is all finished off now, temporarily at least. Why do you leave Satan and his angels? They're the worst people, they're the worst ones of all, right? Aren't they the most criminal? Saving the best till the last. <laughs> Saving the best till the last. Okay, this is a huge problem for those who think that the whole story here is about Roman imperial power because the two beasts, the beast from the sea and the beast from the earth, that's the ones they talk about who are supposed to represent these powers have been disposed already. At the end of Revelation 19, they're already gone. Why doesn't the destruction continue? Why don't you, if you're going to get rid, you're rid of all the subsidiaries, why don't you take out the chief guy? You just throw him in prison for a little while. Can you tell us why? Well, yeah, I think I can, <laughs> but I'm, we're not quite ready to yet. I'm still trying to understand the question. You're okay. saying that, um, okay, the devil's here at the beginning, devil is here at the end. Mm -hmm. Why doesn't God deal with devil at the beginning instead of leaving him at the end after he's done all this destruction? That's is that what, what you're that's, saying? That's the, that's the big question. question. Now we've come to the end. Now we're at the end. And God says, okay, watch me. He grabs the devil. He throws him into this bottomless pit. He locks him up. And the people who th who focuses on human beings... They're, they're, they're not focused on the, the, the beings in the rest of the universe. They're focused on human beings. According to Revelation 19, all the human beings, are, all the wicked ones at least, are dead already. Why do you leave their leader still alive? You just lock him up and, and we're going to see in a moment he's going to be let loose again. Well, what killed the, the other ones? Well, what killed the others first? Well, it says, I mean, we could go back and read through the New Testament and read about what killed them. It says here in Revelation 19, they were thrown into the lake of fire. They were thrown in? That's what it says. Yeah. Okay. Okay. But um, 
the like of fire doesn't really turn into death until Hades is thrown into it. That's the final thing to be thrown That's into the final, it. So they yeah. they could still be alive, only not. Well, then only you've got it. Then you suffering with their own sins, but so's yeah. the devil. But then you've got yeah. You, then you got a problem with God, and what what's God doing that for? Well, it doesn't mean that they're. Well, it depends what your interpretation of that okay, fire well, is. Okay, I guess. let's 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 move on. Let's look at some more of the chapter. Wouldn't it be part of the devil's punishment? Okay. They've got a lot of time to commiserate about what they've been up to for all those. Okay, let let's put the question a slightly different way: Is this God just arbitrarily acting to end things? Nope. No. I mean, if, if he is just arbitrarily deciding, well, I've had enough, time to wipe it up, he should have done that sooner, right? Maybe we're just going to say, well, God has a big time clock, and when it strikes midnight, better well, late than never, right? God is a very organized person. The seasons come and go. The mm -hmm. plants have their time for fruit. God has a time when he's trying to explain something. So everything God does, if you look at the evidence around you, is systematic. Mm -hmm. So this has to be part of a plan, a part yes. of a season, part of a, the fruits coming ripe or something. Okay, so now we're going to go back and we'll read the last sentence in Revelation 20, verse 3. And now it is really, for our Christian friends who aren't quite sure what to do with the book of Revelation, this is just complete nonsense. They don't know what in the world. The la last sentence says, after that, after he's been bound up, locked in the bottomless pit for a thousand years, what happens? After that, he must be let loose for a little while. He must be let loose for a little while? That means there's a reason why he must. That's a very interesting little word in Greek. Look at a couple of other places. Look at Revelation 1.1. 1, 1. This book is the record of the events that Jesus Christ is revealed. God gave him this revelation in order to show his servants what must happen very soon. Christ made these things known to his servant John by sending his angel to him and so forth. So that's a necessity. And the, the Greek word is very clear. This absolutely is necessary. It has to happen. So... Here we have God grabbing the devil, locking him up for a thousand years. We're wondering why didn't he do that? If, he's gonna, if he can do that, why didn't he do that sooner? And now, craziness of all craziness, he's letting him loose again. So we know it wasn't for discipline. This it is no, not... That a thousand years was not for any learning process. It doesn't sound on like his, it. On the part of, of the devil. He yeah. needed the devil completely... Um, Hel uh, helpless, uh, unable to do anything for a thousand years. Well, okay, uh, if we can't, uh, maybe you've all got some good ideas, but let's look at what some of the scholars have said, just for fun. Most scholars say it doesn't make any sense to release Satan at this point. No sense at all. In other words, God has lost his senses. With our contemporary notions of justice and jurisprudence, does it make any sense to let the worst criminal in the world's history, out after he's been in prison for quite a while? What should be done with such a chief villain? He should suffer execution or life without parole, surely, right? So, <laughs> I, mean, would, I mean, any human judge, we would expect that from him, right? Either execution or life without parole. Yes. I mean, there was a woman here recently that was sentenced to, I think, life in prison because she couldn't be killed according to that state's rules, plus 140 years or something. I mean, what would the devil be, you know, yeah. what would be a fair reward, uh -huh. you know, life in prison plus a million more lives? I mean, what would you say about somebody like that? So what are we going to do here? Well, as I said, look at what some of the, 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 uh, the experts have, so-called so experts have said. Austin Fair wrote a book entitled A Rebirth of Images, The Making of St. John's Apocalypse. So here's a guy who's written a whole book about the book of Revelation. He ought to be good, right? He's a great Revelation scholar. It's a wonderful book. And his comment is, but why is Satan merely bound and why is it ever to be loosed again? 
Doesn't make any sense to him. Another Revelation scholar said, this is cared, why once Satan has been securely sealed in the abyss, must he be let loose to wreak further havoc? And what claim does he have on God that God is bound to give the devil his due? I don't think it's, for, it's not for the devil's uh, benefit. It's so that the rest of them that are going to be, the wicked that are going to be raised back to life, let's see what devil, uh, Satan does with them again. Okay. Let, let's look at a couple more places. J.P.M. Sweet from the United Kingdom says, But why, theologically, must he be loose to deceive the nations? And there's your idea. You've got to have something to do with those nations. Why did he have to come down to the earth with great wrath? Why could he not be, that's back in Revelation 12, 12. Why could he not be liquidated from the beginning? We've asked that question before. That's why is this especially true now that action has been taken? If God can do it now, if he can grab the devil and he can actually confine him to that bottomless pit, why didn't he do, I mean, why didn't God at least confine the devil to the bottomless pit during the history of our world? If he's not going to kill him, at least confine him to the bottomless pit, Right. Evil has to be shown for how, how it, what it is. What it is. Well, when God doesn't make sense, there's two things happening. Either God's not making sense or your little mind does not understand what God is doing. Mm -hmm. And so these people should lay aside their degrees and their theology and maybe say, like the, with the innocence of a child, what's going on here? Yeah. What is our God doing? Well, one Revelation scholar from the U.S. here said, why not simply destroy Satan at the beginning of the thousand-year period? Why is it important that Satan is not destroyed during the millennial period? Question. Yeah. During, the, during that period, that thousand-year year period, did everybody become righteous? No. No. Only the righteous, the righteous according to Revel, uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, the righteous are taken to heaven, the wicked die here on this earth, and Satan and his evil angels are confined to this earth and in effect in prison because there's nobody to tempt. Why are we so sure we know what the pit is? Well, the answer is we go back and we look at places in the Bible where that word is used. Well, yes, but pit does have a concept to yeah. it. Sheol was a and, um, word. He used the term. Uh, you know, a pit is confining. A pit, you can't. I mean, there's nothing to do. Mm -hmm. There's there's all kinds of things like that 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 gives you the qualities of a pit. Yeah. Um, maybe that kind of thing happened to him because he put himself in it. Maybe. There, here's and he did. I mean, in what sense has Satan confined himself to this earth? He's made himself so obnoxious that he's not, he's, not, he's not welcome anywhere else in the universe. That's why he's confined here, right? right. right? Definitely. Well, yes, that, yes. that and probably his evil, which yeah. was the direction he was going, yeah. kind of runs out of steam after a while. There's <laughs> nothing left. Yeah. And so you're in the pit. And, yes. um, yeah. yeah, exactly. This, this guy, John MacArthur, I don't know what he is. I like most of his notes, but he does take a curve once in a while. He says, um, when the people get to heaven, they'll be with God and Jesus, and, but then some of them will go bad again. And so Satan will be let out again, and then uh, all the bad people will follow him, and so then God will have to purify once more, and then he'll have heaven nice and clear. Now, we're going we're gonna to talk in a few minutes about... I was paraphrasing what yeah, he said the different. Here. We're going to talk about the different understandings of the millennium, and you'll see why that's a problem, because there, there are some absolutely militantly opposite views about what happens during the millennium. So we, we need to get to that here in a moment. So one, one person, Charles Talbot, said, what's the point? What's the point? Is it possible that God is on trial? We would have to put that in our list of options to see if that possibility fits and makes sense. Is, does God need to prove something? There was a clear question raised back in Genesis. Has God said? Has that question been answered? And what are the experts saying about, how do you like this one? 
one of the most famous revolutionary uh, uh, revolution scholars, revelation, I'm sorry, scholars of all time was a man by the name of R. H. Charles. He came to this verse 3 here in Revelation 20 and he just gave up. And this is what he said. John died when he completed Revelation 20 verse 3 of, uh, uh, of his work and that the, the materials for its completion which were for the most part ready in a series of independent documents <laughs> were put together by a faithful but unintelligent disciple in the order which he thought right. <laughs> so he's saying that John couldn't have written anything else? God, John could not possibly have written these last he has no three proof? chapters in this order. He has no proof of that whatsoever. He just says, it, it's so confusing, John must have died. <laughs> he had some notes, and so did like, like a composer yeah. started a... They're missing something, though, which, yeah. which we haven't got you to yet. The, big finale of it is there's the final judgment of the dead wicked. Yeah. And Satan, he's involved in mm -hmm. the end of that too. He has one last stand. They know what's coming, but that's why. Well, a German scholar, maybe he read what Charles had to say. He said, after the <laughs> capture of the beast, uh, the seers lost interest in the story. <laughs> John doesn't care what he writes anymore. <laughs> William Barclay, a famous Scottish guy, here is our key. The origin of this doctrine is not specifically Christian, but is to be found in certain Jewish beliefs about the Messianic age, which were common in the times after 100 B.C. He had no explanation for it whatsoever. So, d is it really that difficult to try to understand what's going on here? Well, Caird, that we mentioned earlier, says, at this point, something's wrong with the script. <laughs> Well, is anything like this predicted in the Old Testament? Because we've said many times that the, the Gospel of John is in many ways reflects the Old Testament. And the answer is yes. This whole thing is really sort of foretold in Ezekiel 38 and 39. What does that say? Well, we don't have time to read the whole thing, but it talks about Gog and Magog and how, what's going to happen to the wicked and, and, and the, the evil eventually going to destroy themselves. That's what it says over there. Well, we're just about to a break time, but look at the next three, two or three verses. Then I saw thrones, and those who sat on them were given the power to judge. I also saw the souls of those who had been executed because they had proclaimed the truth that Jesus revealed in the Word of God. Now, we read up earlier that the martyrs are going to be with Jesus. So these would be the souls who have been executed, right? They had not worshipped the beast or its image, nor had they received the mark on the beast, of the beast on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life and ruled as kings with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead, and then this, this is in parentheses in my Bible, the rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were over. This is the first raising of the dead. Now if we say the first raising of the dead, what are we implying? There must be at least one more, right? Maybe there's multiple ones, but there's at least a second. This is the first raising of the dead. Happy and greatly blessed are those who are included in this first raising of the dead. The second death, now if we're talking about a second death, there must be how many deaths? At least two, it's right? Two. Mm -hmm. Has no power over them. They shall be priests of God and of Christ, and they will rule with him for a thousand years. So here's something else that's going on for a thousand years, right? And we have two resurrections mentioned. We have two deaths mentioned. How do we fit all these pieces together? And we're going to have to solve that puzzle when we come back. Don't go away.
Welcome back. We're so glad you decided to stay by. I hope you're finding this stuff as fascinating and maybe puzzling in some respects as we are. We're now over in Revelation 20, verses 4 to 7. And it's talking about souls who have been executed because they had claimed the truth that Jesus revealed and the Word of God. If you look at that passage more carefully, you discover that these are people who have been axed. The Greek word literally says axed or beheaded. Who would those people be? These, I mean, those would be martyrs, right? Mm -hmm. Wouldn't they be martyrs? And usually we think of martyrs as people who are big time losers, right? They lose their lives. Now, do the 144,000 lose their lives? No, this? they don't. So this is pre-144,000. Yep. Now, is this, is this distinct from when Christ returns, the dead in Christ shall rise first? It seems to me that's what is here, or could be. Or is this yeah. a different entity? Yeah, no. It's not a different entity. This is part of that, yes. So this whole pro passage seems to be end-oriented. We, we, we think that. That's pretty clear. It seems to be talking about the climax of the story, just as Gary suggested. The end of the beast in its image was in a few verses before that. It is the vindication of the people who were involved, who gave a true testimony of Jesus, or the testimony of Jesus, down through the generations. So here are people who have spoken the truth about God down through the generations. They have, many of them have lost their lives in the process of trying to do that. And now, where are they? They're sitting on thrones beside God, judging, right? So the losers have become winners, right? Yeah. Well, let's look at verse 7 now, the first part. After the thousand years were over, Satan will be let loose from his prison, and he will go out to deceive the nations scattered over the whole world, that is, Gog and Magog. Okay? What have we learned? Well, let's, let's see if we can go quickly over this just to sort of get the picture. After the thousand years are over, Satan will be let loose from his prison. So, A, in Revelation 20, verse 2, Satan is bound for a thousand years, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In Revelation 20, verse 3, he is still bound until the thousand years are ended. Mm -hmm. In Revelation 20, verse 4, the resurrected righteous reign with Christ for a thousand years. Doesn't that sound like it's the same thousand years? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it suggests that these are resurrected martyrs. The others, the non-righteous would seem to be, are not resurrected until the thousand years are ended, right? Then in Revelation 20, verse 6, the resurrected righteous will reign with Christ for a thousand years. It the verse 6 is really a repetition of verse 4. Then, but at the end of the thousand years, Satan is released again. There seems to be only two groups described here, two realities. Satan is bound at the beginning of the thousand years. At that time, there's also a first resurrection of righteous martyrs who then reign. At the end of the thousand years, Satan is released. At that time, there's a second resurrection of the non-righteous, right? Yes. So we have God and those who are on his side, and we have who else? The devil and his minions. The devil and his minions. So after the thousand years, everybody who was not gods on this earth will be raised again. Yes. And they will <clears throat> face the judgment or whatever. Yeah. But so Satan will be released and everybody who is not on God's side will be raised from the dead after the thousand years. In other words, if the righteous have already lived for a thousand years and they come back with Jesus to this earth, and all the wicked are also raised, then how many people are going to be alive at the same time on this earth? Everybody who has Everybody. ever lived. Everybody who has ever lived, presumably. The righteous inside the city, the wicked outside the city, right? Mm -hmm. Well, now let's talk about why there's so much confusing confusion about the millennium. There are incredible variations and pluralism among Christians in explaining what is going to happen during these thousand years. Let's look at some of the views. The most widely held view is called dispensational premillennialism. That's a long name. Dispensational premillennialism. It was made popular by the Left Behind series of books. Sixty million copies of those books have been sold in the United States. 
Dispensational premillennialism is held as truth by charismatic and Pentecostal groups around the world. And so what does it teach? They say that there will be a seven-year period of tribulation after which Jesus will come back to the earth and reign during the millennium. Okay? A period of seven years of terrible tribulation, and then Jesus comes, and <coughs> what happens for the next thousand years? Jesus is going to reign here on this earth, right? Yeah. That's everybody? Well, everybody presumably. Presum presumably. One of the big questions which faces Christians regarding this is, does the reappearance of Israel as a political reality, and these people got really into political stuff here, as a political reality have some theological significance? Is it important for our theological understanding that Israel now has been reestablished as a nation? In this paradigm, Israel is going to return to God and there is going to be a conversion of many Jews, at least. They believe that there will be a reestablishment of the nation of Israel as a vindication of their interpretation of the book of Revelation. Okay, And you will see groups here and there all over the place talking about people going to Israel, reestablishing a headquarter, world headquarters in, in, in Israel, in Jerusalem, Jesus coming down to reign in Jerusalem and so forth. That's all a part of that stuff, okay? So, these people are suggesting that there's going to be a great tribulation for seven years just before the millennium. So their views are technically called pre-tribulation, pre-millennialism. What does that mean? Because they believe that true believers in Jesus will be raptured before the tribulation takes place. So, what happens then? If you're good, what happens to you? You're raptured. You're raptured. Oh, yeah. You disappear. You well, this, take is, this is also the, some Baptists. Uh, like They don't want to worry about the future because they're going to be out of here. Yeah. They're not going to have to deal with it. That's why they're called pre-tribulation, pre-millennialists. Uh, because they, uh, okay. But Jesus will return after the tribulation and rule on this earth during the millennium. Some teach that believers will be raptured during the tribulation. So some would say, okay, while the tribulation is going on, then, you know, okay, things are getting hot, so Yoli is going to go up. And, you know. Well, they kind of filter up? Yeah. Okay. okay. Well, all of these views suggest that the millennium is a pretty good, let's see, did I, get, did I skip anything here? No, that's correct. All of these views suggest that the millennium is a pretty good time because Satan is bound, and in this view, Christ returns at the beginning of the millennium. In this view, although there is some variation in the understanding of it, Armageddon is like the climax of the Great Tribulation. So there's a terrible time. The righteous are taken off out of this trouble. There's this terrible battle called Armageddon. And then Jesus comes down. Satan is bound. He rules. And the whole world is peaceful and quiet because Satan is bound and Jesus is, is in control. For a thousand years? For a thousand years. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, turn to another group. This group is called the historical premillennialists. There's no rapture. This is a little less specific. It is a much older view where Christ returns at the beginning of the millennium. This view is much less political, but it also looks at the millennium as a good place. So things may be bad or good, we're not sure, but at some point in time, Jesus is going to come down here, he's going to rule for a thousand years, and everything will be great. It has an optimistic view of events during the millennium. Of course, who's reigning? Jesus is reigning, right? Then there's another view known as amillennialism. In this view, there is no specific thousand-year period. The thousand years mentioned in Revelation are considered to be just symbolic of all of church history since the times of Jesus. The primary proponent of this was Augustine. Luther and Calvin seem to follow his suggestions in this respect. The millennium, in their view, is really just a symbol for Christian history. That's the Calvinist. I've, yeah. I've read some of their revelation. Yeah. Then there's another view known as post-millennialism. This, of course, separates itself from all the previous views by saying that the time that the coming of Christ will happen at the end of the millennium. So what happens during the millennium? It all, this view also has a very optimistic view of the millennium. According to this view, during the millennium, most people will be converted and turned to God. It'll be a kind of golden age because everything's getting better and better, right? 
This view is less popular today. It seems to be a very optimistic view of history. Is that but the Jehovah Witness? Uh, no. Okay. I don't think so. There may be some. I don't know. But this opt optimistic view of history seems to be in conflict with historical realities. The 20th century with its wars, holocaust, depression, genocides, has been a defeat for the post-millennialists. It doesn't look like things are getting better and better. But there are still many people who hold that view. So, what is the Seventh-day Adventist view? Well, the Adventist view fits most closely with historic premillennialism. But there is one huge difference between the Adventist view and all of the other views. The Adventist view believes that here on this earth, now remember, what are the, where are the saints during the thousand years according to the Adventist view? In heaven. In heaven. They're in heaven. The saints are removed from this earth and taken to heaven. So on this earth there's nothing but death and Satan and his angels are bound here with total destruction surrounding them. All of the other views hold that it will be a, some kind of golden age. So, so where, where does it, um, what's our indicator that we'll be in heaven? Jesus says, I'm going to come and take you back, John 14. He says, I, Doesn't Paul say something about the second Paul coming? says a lot in 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 17, very clearly, I'm going to come down, I'm going to take you, I'm going to take you back. Revelation talks about people going to heaven as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, summary statements. Then we'll talk about our view in more detail. The most widely held view of the millennium, views of the millennium, see it as a golden time of peace. The binding of Satan is seen as, as though Satan is coercively bound for a period of time. Not practically bound or circumstantially bound, but coercively bound by God. God grabs him, binds him up, and throws him in the pit. The angel, um, this is a key point. And the language is very forceful language in Revelation 20, 1 to 3. One to three. We, we already saw that. The angel comes down with a chain and a key, and he seizes Satan and throws him into the bottomless pit. Don't those verbs seem forceful, seem, suggest forceful divine action, curtailing the activities of Satan? But theologically, that has some major challenges. If that is the final solution to the sin problem, the first question should be what we've already talked about before, why didn't God do it sooner, right? If the issues in the cosmic conflict can be solved by some sort of coercive intervention against Satan, we should ask, why didn't you do it sooner, God? If we can come up with a logical reason why Satan should be bound at this time, coercively, then why in the world would he later be released? That doesn't seem to make any sense, does it? In fact, he must be released according to that little Greek word, day, for a short period of time. Is it possible that this is all somehow just symbolic and not really literal coercion? Well, even if it is symbolic, it's supposed to mean something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Does this have something to do with Jesus' statement in Luke 10 to 18, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven? Does that come into play here, maybe? Well, Jesus is saying, yes, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. This suggests that there is something more than just a literal coercive action going on. It doesn't say God threw him out of heaven. He fell, right? Here's a quotation suggesting one view of what this binding means. This is from one of these experts that we read before that couldn't figure out what in the world was going on. God binds the deceiver and sets up a period of time in which he, his will is perfectly clear and obvious to all, right? Nevertheless, it is all to no avail. When the deceiver is set free, he still proves that humans cannot blame their sinfulness on their environment or circumstances. What are they doing? As soon as they're let free, what are they, what are they doing, those, all the wicked people? Back to following Satan, right? Satan is apparently out of the picture for a while. Does this, mean, does this statement seem logical to you? Or is it patently illogical? If you say that everything is good while Satan is bound, and everything is bad when he's released, then wouldn't you blame your behavior on the environment? Mm -hmm. It would sort of look like it, wouldn't it? Yeah, and it's not only a few people. The numbers were so many. It's like, you know, sins. It's like sins. It's so yeah, many it's the of the sea. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and they're marching up there. Um, they're trying to conquer the, holy, the new Jerusalem, the holy mm -hmm. city of God. 
Well, you know, with some of these theories, Satan is a deceiver at heart. And I can see Satan saying, this is the millennium. Satan is bound up. So I'm Jesus and and I and and mm -hmm. and and Satan is saying that he's bound up and he's pretending to be Jesus and if he's a deceiver and Jesus says watch out for the deceiver I can see how he can use some of these theories to his advantage. Yeah. Okay, let's look at another one. This is written by a gentleman by the name of McLeod. Just as he was allowed to enter Eden so in the restoration of paradise, the millennial earth, he will be permitted to do it again. Would that be, does that sound logical to you? He, he didn't make a big enough mess the first time, we got to try it again. No, no. because oh if, God. if God is going to let it happen a second time, why not a third time and a fourth yeah. time and a fifth time? So We're just going to go on and on having these messes. It's almost like he's got a half truth there. Yeah. It's like... Uh, if you look at this overall, by the time we all get to there, we should have no doubt what the devil does. But it sort of finally puts the end lid on what the devil's all about. One last time, or what did he do? Back as he always has. Then he says, this expert, this final chapter in the world's history will again demonstrate that people perpetually embrace evil unless sustained by sovereign grace. And I would suggest this is completely incomprehensible. There's no logic to it. Are we suggesting that the reason there's a problem here right now is because there's an absence of divine grace? What is this scholar trying to say? And if we're trying to determine whether the reason why Satan should be released, none of these statements seem to give us any kind of help. Now, let's see if we can put things together here from a biblical perspective. What is the state of the earth before the millennium? What is the state of the earth? These are the questions we're going to try to answer. What is the state of the earth during the millennium? What happens to believers when Jesus returns? Okay? We need to know those questions and the answers to those questions. Well, look at Revelation 8, verses 8 and 9. Okay? This would be just before the millennium. Then the second angel blew his trumpet. Something that looked like a huge mountain on fire was thrown into the sea. A third of the sea was turned into blood. A third of the living creatures in the sea died. And a third of the ships were destroyed. So, does that sound like everything's just becoming wonderful and happy? And No. Not at all. It looks like things are getting really bad, doesn't it? Well, we recognize that this is symbolic language. It still looks like a lot of demonic reality playing out and we've suggested that the the number one-third a la revelation 12 1 and 3 the number one-third represents satanic activity in the book of revelation now look at the second angel in the bowl sequence that would be revelation 16 verse 3 then the second angel poured out his bowl on the sea the water became like the blood of a dead person and everything every living creature in the sea died what happens if every living creature in the sea dies? We all die. <laughs> we all die. Why is that? It pollutes just about everything. It pollutes everything? But that's not all. There's something that most of us have no idea about. I, I've forgotten the exact percentage, but it's something like 80% of, you know, we breathe out carbon dioxide and we breathe in oh, oxygen. Brother. Something like 80%, oh. and, and then the plants have to breathe in carbon dioxide and breathe out oxygen, so there's a cycle. Something like 80% of the carbon dioxide turned back to oxygen is done by creatures, the little plankton in the sea. So what would happen to us in a relatively short period of time? We may suffer, suffocate. Suffocate. We die. So if, if everything in the sea is dead, so is everything else dead very quickly. Okay? So... Um, the book of Isaiah has four chapters that could legitimately be considered apocalyptic literature. Look at what the Old Testament says about what's going to happen at the end. I'm reading Isaiah 24, verses 3 to 6. The earth will lie shattered and ruined. The Lord has spoken and it will be done. The earth dries up and withers. The whole world grows weak. Both earth and sky decay. The people have defiled the earth by breaking God's laws and by violating the covenant made to last forever. So God has pronounced a curse on the earth. Its people are paying for what they have done. Fewer and fewer remain alive. Does that sound like a golden age? 
No. It certainly doesn't. If you read on, drop down a few verses, Isaiah 24 down to 19 and 20. The earth will crack and shatter and split open. The earth itself will stagger like a drunken man and sway like a hut in a storm. The world is weighed down by its sins. It will collapse and never rise again. Does that sound like a golden age? Yep. Well, what about Jeremiah? Look at these verses that may have been picked up by the Apostle John. Jeremiah 4, verses 23 to 25. I looked at the earth. It was a barren waste. At the sky, there was no light. I looked at the mountains. They were shaking, and the hills were rocking to and fro. I saw that there were no people. Even the birds had flown away. The fertile land had become a desert. The cities were in ruins because of the Lord's fierce anger. So, are these chapters just, do they have some meaning? Is it talking about real possibilities here? Or is this just fairy tales? That seems more probable than the world is getting better and better, especially in these days. Although I certainly don't want to see the world when it shakes and quakes like that. That yeah. would be scary. We would no longer be on firm ground. We might go spinning off into outer space. Who knows? Well, Gary, you asked about what happens to the righteous people earlier. First Thessalonians 4, verses 16 and 17. There will be the shout of the command. In fact, let, let me start with verse 13. First Thessalonians, I'm going to go back to verse 13. Our brothers and sisters, we want you to know the truth about those who have died, so that you will not be sad, as there are those who have no hope. We believe that, this is Paul writing, we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will take back with Jesus those who have died believing in him. What we are teaching you now is the Lord's teaching. We who are alive on the day the Lord comes will not go ahead of those who have died. There will be the shout of command, the archangel's voice, the sound of God's trumpet, and the Lord himself will come down from heaven. Those who have died believing in Christ will rise to life first. Then we who are living at that time will be gathered up along with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So we will always be with the Lord. So then encourage one another with these words. So what's, what, what's, going to, what's going to happen to the righteous at the end? Go to heaven. They're either going to come up from the grave to go to heaven, or if they're alive, they're just going to go up to go to heaven. And do we have any words from Jesus suggesting that? Yes. Look at John 14. Do not be worried and upset. Jesus told them, believe in God and believe also in me. There are many rooms in my Father's house, and I am going to prepare a place for you. And where is he going? Back to heaven. Back to heaven. I would not tell you this if it were not so. Jesus says, I'm not lying to you. And after I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to myself so that you will be with me where I am. Is that pretty clear? Yes. Sounds pretty clear, doesn't it? So we see that there are key Old Testament and New Testament passages which picture the earth during the millennium, not as a golden age, but as a wasteland. In this scenario, Satan is not bound coercively, but by a set of circumstances, a set of circumstances of his own creation, right? Why is it that he can't go to any other part of the universe? He's not he, welcome. He's made himself persona non grata, right? Yeah. Um, Satan is confined by a reality which is almost completely of his own making. The first resurrection refers to the resurrection of the believers only, the wicked are left behind dead. But if the believers are removed from the earth, it is only a temporary removal because the earth itself is going to be redeemed and become God's future home. And that's what we'll be talking about in the next couple of sessions when what's going to happen? It's going to be purified and remade. We're going to talk about a new earth and a new heaven. So who's going to live in the new earth and the new heaven? What's going to happen to that? mess that Satan is in the midst of here. God is going to clean it up. Okay. And for those of you who are familiar with the writings of Ellen White, if you wanted to see the details, I would suggest that you turn to the book Great Controversy. Go to page 672 and read until you get to the end of the story. That'll be about 600, uh, I'm sorry, 662 to 672 approximately. Is the, are the pages there, where the whole picture is presented. And let me, and this is the Adventist view, let me just review, go over it very quickly. At the time of the 
third coming now, Jesus will come down from heaven with the righteous, and behind them will be the new Jerusalem. The righteous will enter the new Jerusalem. It will be set down on this earth, splitting open the Mount of Olives. That's in Zechariah. And that will be set. Satan will, all the wicked will be resurrected, and Satan and all the wicked will say, okay, here's our chance. We've got to get over here. We've got to conquer this city. We at least have to get in here long enough to get to the tree of life so we can live forever. But as they're approaching the city, suddenly the city rises off of the surface of the earth, and high above it, we see Jesus being enthroned. And he is crowned as King of kings and Lord of lords right there in the full view of not only all the righteous in the side, inside the city, but all the wicked outside the city. And then what happens? There, and during the course of this time, the, the wicked are just transfixed. They, 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 they're not attacking the city anymore. They're just, they, their eyes are glued on what's happening. And then God is going to show a panorama and basically the panorama is going to be a fantastic 3D color picture of the story of the great controversy from beginning to end. And when that's all over, what's going to happen? The story of planet Earth from the story of The story of sin it began in heaven when it came down to this earth. And then the story of everything that's happened on this earth until, and including the life and death of Jesus, including the whole story of the Christian church, including everything that's happening and in our day. And everybody will see their lives go in front of them. And everybody will see how they are a part of that whole story. And then what happens? Destruction. Everybody will fall down and say, God. Yeah. And where do you find right. that? Philippians 2, verses 10 and 11. Even the devil be down on his knees saying, God, you did everything you could possibly. The story will be so compelling that even the devil will be down on his knees. And then when they, when they, they say, oh no, what are we doing on our knees? We were here to conquer the city. They rise up and God says, okay, recognize the truth. And the wicked will say, we realize that we're outside the city because this is where we chose to be. The righteous will say, we're inside the city because this is where we chose to be. And God's glory will spell out over the earth. And in, in, uh, Desire of Ages, page 107, says, the glory that gives life to the righteous will destroy the wicked. And next time we'll have to talk about how that works out. See you then.